So what I'm going to do is, um, yeah, I try to give a brief overview on solubilization, not so much on processes and technologies, but more on the excipients used and um, yeah, the drug delivery systems. I think I need the, uh, the pointer. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay. And I will also try to describe, um, yeah, um, a way into the future. Uh, what is going to happen? To the, uh, what? Um, yeah, we might see. Yeah. Okay. Which one? Ah, so that was <laughs> good. Okay, um, it was touched already, yeah, the solubility and bioavailability, uh, we had a challenge. Um, yeah, if you imagine, yeah, the Venus of Milo, yeah, is much more soluble than a lot of APIs, yeah, and the order of magnitude, yeah, between the solubility of the Venus uh, here of Milo, yeah, and soluble APIs that, uh, is really huge, yeah. And there's a principle what cannot be dissolved, cannot be absorbed, and cannot cure. Yeah? So what we have to focus on that, uh, is increasing the solubility and try to yeah, get the active uh, through the intestinal mucosa. It's not only solubility yeah, which needs to be addressed. There are also yeah, some other uh, factors um, yeah, involved, and this is also something that uh, I'm going to talk about. Yeah? Um, and you also see um, yeah, the soluble actives that uh, will uh, become relatively small yeah, in number. We will have uh, a huge, a larger number that, uh, of insoluble actives. Now let's have a look what can formulators do in order to achieve a higher solubility. They can work on drug substances yeah, right at the beginning. Yeah. Um, drug modifications to da, yeah, are made, yeah, making salts, yeah, solvates, co-crystals, or polymorphs. Yeah. So this is um, mainly done more in the chemical department. Yeah. Uh, what then comes more to yeah, the pharmaceutical department is um, influencing the particle size, yeah, reducing the particle size tremendously and increasing the surface area. Or... Um, yeah, coming from the other way, coming from a dissolved API and precipitating it into, into nanoparticles. This is something we do at a large scale when um, yeah, manufacturing our uh, carotenoid formulations because carotenoids are also substances to the, which behave like brickstones to the, and are not bioavailable as pure substances at all. Now... Um, excipients come into the game to, uh, uh, yeah, in this area, yeah, starting with complexation. Non-amphiphilic polymers can be used. PVP is also uh, yeah, well known to act as a complexing agent. Yeah, the cyclodextrins to, uh, are materials to, uh, which are also commonly used. Solubilization, uh, we are entering to, uh, this area. Uh, typically require amphiphilic uh, yeah, the polymers, yeah, surfactants in a certain way, or polymers that are having surfactant properties. SMETs, microemulsions, uh, yeah, were already mentioned, mixed micelles, yeah, liposomes, and so on. And on the other hand, we have uh, the systems, um, yeah, solid solutions and dispersions. Okay. Um, yeah, when dealing with different uh, yeah, dosage forms, it's of course obvious yeah, that yeah, there will be no single excipient fitting yeah, to everything and solving all, all the problems. Yeah? Each yeah, dosage form has particular requirements. Yeah? For instance, if the final product should be a solid oral dosage form, the whole formulation that, uh, has to have a solid state it uh, has to be compressible and uh, it shouldn't be yeah, the sticky yeah, because this um, he, he affects your yeah, compressibility. And of course, that, uh, it automatically means that, uh, that products like um, yeah, the Coli for RH40 in large quantities that, uh, are not suitable that, uh, for, yeah, for this purpose. 
other materials that are like polymers that are having a solid state already um, yeah, are much more suitable in this regard. Um, yeah, when going to the liquid dosage forms, yeah, um, other parameters play a role, like um, stability to hydrolysis. Yeah, because we are in an aqueous system, um, yeah, the dosage form has to be uh, yeah, stored for three years. Yeah? So yeah, such, uh, uh, yeah, such a surfactant uh, must be stable in, in this requirement. This is a basic prerequisite. Yeah? Um, and if you look to parenteral dosage forms, it's quite obvious. This is the most challenging area for solubilization. Yeah? Because many other factors um, have to be regarded yeah, in order to uh, formulate a new product. Um, yeah, um, and factors that are like hemolysis, immogenicity play a role, histamine release, the product should be yeah, sterilizable, so it should overcome um, yeah, 120 degrees yeah, for 15 or 20 minutes. Yeah. And yeah, it must either be uh, biodegradable to the, or it must have a low molecular weight in order that it can be excreted um, yeah, by the kidneys. Yeah. And also um, other uh, parameters are relevant then for dermal dosage forms. Um, yeah, the tolerability yeah, on the skin is one of a crucial factor here. <clears throat> now, um, yeah, what kinds of products are available on the market um, for solubilization? Yeah? We have um, yeah, completely different chemical classes here, yeah? starting from phospholipids, yeah? um, more derived yeah, from nature. We have the poloxamas, yeah? EOPO blockopolymers. Yeah, these are ethers from um, yeah, from a, yeah, the chemical uh, yeah, the point of point of view, it automatically means that uh, those materials are extremely stable in an aqueous environment. Yeah, um, and this is different to all the esters. Yeah, uh, yeah which we have in polysorbates. Um, yeah, or or in in polyoxyl glycerides or in the coliform yeah, yeah, EL and RH grades. We have the, yeah, the beta cyclodextrins. Beta cyclodextrins offer the opportunity, yeah, that they are not amphiphilic or amphiphilic only to yeah, a small portion. Yeah, they have a different, yeah, the complexation, yeah, I would say approach. Yeah, um, and this can offer some benefits, particularly um, yeah, when dealing with parenteral dosage forms. And we have as a, as a particular polymer, and this was the first, um, yeah, the first polymeric solubilizer which was introduced uh, yeah, into pharma. We have the soluplus um, having a large molecular weight yeah, connected with um, a high degree of um, yeah, amphiphilicity. Okay, the biopharmaceutical classification system was already mentioned. Yeah? And you are very familiar with it. Yeah? So um, what we all want to achieve is uh, transferring um, formulations to, oh, yes, yeah, sorry, going back. Transferring formulations to the, um, which are based on class two yeah, the, yeah, the drugs by various technologies to the, into the area of class one. And the particular challenge that there are the class three and class four ingredients, where we need to yeah to use permeation enhancers yeah in order to achieve um, a high bioavailability, and the question is how to formulate uh, class three and class four as yes, the substances. What kind of opportunities exist? Um, a brief. Um, yeah, a brief introduction to the, into those opportunities. We have been dealing with some uh, yeah, the strategies that, uh, which are mentioned here in the past. Uh, here, we are a little bit in a dilemma, yeah? how, how these permeation enhancers are considered by authorities. 
yeah, because um, yeah, probably yeah, this permeation enhancers will not only drive our wanted drug into the body, maybe we also have yeah, some other components that, uh, which are in food, which yeah, or other drugs which are co-applied, yeah, are also enhanced in their bioavailability. Yeah? So this is a, a kind of a dilemma. Um, and that's also one of the reasons that, uh, why um, yeah, developers of excipients um, are a little bit reluctant uh, in offering solutions that are in this area. Um, yeah, what are the uh, um, routes for taking up uh, yeah, yeah, the such um, actives? It's of course um, yeah, the route paracellularly, yeah, why are the tight junctions? Yeah? Um, years ago, we have been working together with uh, Professor Junginger on, on some uh, polyacrylates, um, yeah, maleic acid copolymers, chelating calcium, and those polymers that are uh, being able to chelate uh, yeah, and complex calcium open, open um, yeah, the tight junctions. That, uh, and we did uh, a bio study uh, yeah, in rats with low molecular weight heparin. And this led to an increase yeah, significantly, I think it was fivefold or tenfold, by co application the, of such a polymer. So there are opportunities existing. Yeah? However, yeah, it's a question to, uh, how this will be considered by authorities. Uh, PGP is also a um, very well known transporter, yeah, transporting already absorbed molecules that are back into uh, yeah, the lumen of the intestine. And there are mainly three well known um, excipients impacting PGP or having a PGP inhibiting action. Um, one is yeah, the TPGS. Yeah, the other one is Colifor EL, and the third one to da is um, uh, it was introduced by Professor Kabanov, um, who was yeah, dealing heavily with Poloxima. So da, it's Poloxima P85. Uh, Unfortunately, yeah, da, this molecule is not covered da, by the monograph of Poloximas. Yeah. Um, I'm pretty sure that also a high degree of supersaturation will also drive class three and four get the compound stronger into the body. So this is a more or less a general approach. And um, probably you all know the, here the work of Professor Ben Kopschnürsch, who is dealing with thiolated polymers, bioadhesive polymers. Uh, aim is here, um, yeah, prolonging the residence time, yeah, in the body, yeah, in order that yeah, yeah that more active is absorbed, um, and the thiolated polymers, um, yeah, should interact uh, with the mucus, um, and by this, um, yeah, should enhance the uh, uh, permeation of uh, yeah, drug molecules. Okay, um, yeah, surfactants are not just used for solubilization. They have other, um, yeah, other actions yeah, besides uh, yeah, the, their main action. Yeah, for instance, uh, polysorbate 80 is well known um, also for drug targeting. Yeah, so if nanoparticles that are coated with polysorbate 80, uh, uptake uh, yeah, into the brain is very much enhanced. Yeah? There are many studies uh, yeah, that are revealing this. Um, it's also well known that, uh, that surfactants or, or, or the PGP inhibition plays a role um, yeah, in, in uh, yeah, oncologic treatments yeah? because uh, yeah, multidrug resistance can be overcome. Yeah, by PGP inhibitors. Yeah? And the EPR effect is more effect of um, yeah, nanoparticles and the nanoparticle size, but typically for making nanoparticles, all those effectants um, are required. Um, 
another uh, yeah, action of the factons is um, not only overcoming um, yeah, yeah, borders that are in the human body, yeah, but also prolonging the, yeah, yeah, the half-life um, yeah, of um, yeah, drug formulations. And it can go um, yeah, up, to, up to 40 hours. So the, um, the effect, yeah, the beside the action is the, yeah, the, these surfactants that are having a very uh, or, or a less rigid uh, structure to uh, um, lead to a softer surface to uh, of the nanoparticles to uh, and soft surfaces to uh, are not recognized to uh, uh, here by the immune system, yeah, by dendritic cells or macrophages. To the, uh, if, you, if the nanoparticles have a very solid structure, to the, yeah, the, they are considered to the, as an external yeah, the substance or external particles, to the, and then yeah, the, yeah, the, yeah, yeah, they are captured and degraded. Okay, uh, yeah, PGP is the mostly used material here, yeah, but um, it's um, yeah, not the best one and there is a need yeah, to have better ones. Um, biologics have already been mentioned yeah, uh, yeah, by Monica. Um, surfactants are also used in biologics and they play a major role here. Yeah? I think there is almost no biologic uh, drug formulation without a surfactant. Uh, because uh, what do surfactants do here? Yeah? They cover the surface, yeah? they cover the surface to the, uh, of the glass wall as well as they uh, yeah, to go to the, yeah, the interface uh, between air and liquid and prevent uh, that the proteins uh, yeah, go to this surface and proteins are mainly degraded or are changing the, the, the structure when being attached to a different surface. When you uh, manage to keep them in an aqueous environment, in a true aqueous environment, that they are pretty stable. Yeah, so this is one of the major factors uh, yeah, why surfactants are used, because surfactants here need to cover yeah, the surface to the, and prevent the, the proteins to the, yeah, yeah, you can move to yeah, the surfaces and being degraded. Polysorbates are very old yeah, surfactants, well-known. Yeah, I would call them the first generation. They are associated with a lot of problems yeah, uh, due to hydrolysis also. Yeah, yeah, they undergo hydrolysis. It can lead to particle formulation. Uh, yeah, to particle formation. It can also impact uh, yeah, the stability of the whole formulation. Yeah, Poloxomers are considered to be yeah, the second generation because they are stable. Um, a little bit less effective, yeah, because they are less amphiphilic. Yeah. Uh, however, I would say yeah, there is a strong need here for yeah for new surfactants that uh, being able to uh, yeah to substitute and not only to substitute yeah to, but to improve the effect of um, yeah polysorbates here. Now I want to switch back to solid oral dosage forms, and um, yeah, what we did some years ago, probably most of you know, yes, yeah, Soluplus. Um, yeah, this is um, a so-called NCE, new chemical entity, in the area of excipients, and uh, and this is really a rare species because uh, almost no company, no supplier company, yet yeah, it takes a burden. Uh, of developing a new compound, yeah, because regarding yeah, toxicological studies, for instance, we have to carry out the same range of toxicological studies as you have for a new drug. There's almost no difference, and you can imagine the, the, what this costs, yeah, and how long the development time is. Yeah, it took us seven years to develop this compound. We synthesized the, the, it's mentioned here the, the, uh, we had a thousand polymers in order to find the appropriate structure. Yeah. And this structure is yeah, definitely unique. It's unique in pharma. I, yeah, there hasn't been yeah, such a copolymer. 
And also its effect is unique uh, because um, yeah, so, so far um, only non-amphiphilic uh, yeah, materials that have been used uh, in, in the formation of solid dispersions. And this material intru introduces the solubilization um, yeah, yeah, capabilities that are into solid dispersions. It, it means when the solid dispersion <laughs> dissolves, the solubilizer that, uh, will solubilize at least a certain amount of the drug. Yeah. Um, a non-amphiphilic uh, polymer is not able, or typically not able, to solubilize a drug in the aqua system, yeah? so it will precipitate then. In case of soliplus, it can precipitate too, but at least yeah, the amount which is solubilized later on, yeah, this will always stay in solution and will, um, yeah, yeah, it will, re it will result in a higher driving force coming from the concentration gradient um, yeah, across the mucosa. Yeah, uh, the impact on the drug release that is shown here, uh, as you see. And uh, we also did um, a bio study using yeah, Sempera, yeah, so we have the drug on the market. Um, yeah, the same amount of active was applied. A bio study on yeah, yeah, in dogs yeah, was performed, and what we got is uh, is an increase in bioavailability of two point three. It means the dose yeah, that could be halved yeah, um, yeah, when using such a formulation. So and now I'm coming to a completely a new approach, and I'm really happy to that this is the first time to that this is, um, I would say, offered to the public. Um, we have developed um, yeah, a new polymer, or we have a polymer under still under development, yeah, um, which addresses a completely yeah, new approach which hasn't been pursued so far in pharma. Yeah. So what we realized is uh, almost 80% of all drugs are, are basic. Yeah. So only 20% are either neutral or acidic. Yeah, this is the major class. And um, we developed a polymer which is able to form um, salts with basic molecules. So what is the benefit of a polymer? The benefit of a polymer is that uh, it's typically amorphous. There are only a few crystalline or semi-crystalline polymers. Yeah? Only polymers having no functional groups yeah, on the backbone uh, yeah, can be crystalline, like poloxamers or PEG. If functional groups are introduced, yeah, so yeah, carboxylic groups or whatever, yeah, they get amorphous yeah, because the chains that are cannot uh, yet be ordered in a regular way anymore. Yeah? So yeah, typical polymers are, uh, let's say, amorphous. Yeah? And um, if the counter ion is amorphous, a drug salt yeah, can only be amorphous. Yeah, yeah, so it must automatically lead to a thermodynamically stable salt. Yeah, so there is no risk of um, crystallization yeah, anymore. Uh, yeah, the background here yeah, is shown here. Yeah, we don't have any lattice energy. Yeah, yeah so this term that, uh, gets, uh, of course, then more negative. And if you introduce it uh, into this term, yeah, the, sat yeah, the saturation solubility increases. Yeah. So what we want to avoid uh, by this is avoid the crystalline structure yeah, by yeah, its principle or by a new principle. So how does the polymer look like? Yeah, the polymer is a copolymer of uh, vinyl proledone and acrylic acid. And the acrylic acid moiety is capable to undergo yeah, the salt or ion-ion uh, yeah, the reactions. Yeah. How can the polymeric salts be formed? Yeah. Uh, it's, pretty, it's, pretty, it's pretty easy. 
uh, very conventional yeah, techniques like um, yeah, hot metal extrusion, like spray drying, also fluid bed uh, he, he approaches can be used here. Um, and the benefit, an additional benefit, is of course yeah, that um, this yeah, the solubility enhancement um, leads also to an enhancement in bioavailability. I'm going to show this later on. Now, what is the difference now? Yeah, yeah you might argue, yeah, yeah we have already yeah, the polymers having carboxylic groups, yeah, like uh, yeah, the colicode MAE, Eudrashid L, VTD, uh, yeah, and other stuff. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's true. But these polymers always act as enteric polymers. Yeah, they have a pH dependent dissolution behavior. This polymer, and it dissolves between pH 1 and pH 14. Even, even in the free, uh, you know, or as a free acid, yeah, in the carboxylic, um, yeah, yeah, in the non-deprotonated yet yeah, state, it is completely water-soluble, as you can see here. Yeah, yeah. Right, yeah, yeah, this is... Um, yeah, pro probably yeah, ten percent solution to, um, of the VPAA copolymer, and is absolutely transparent and clear. So, how can we prove uh, yeah, that we have really iron iron uh, yeah, interaction yeah, uh, with this polymer and actives? Yeah? Uh, we did it with isothermal yeah, titration calorimetry, and it's well known. Um, hydrogen bond uh, lead to an, an energy or an enthalpy to the of um, uh, 20 to 40 kilojoule per mole yeah? and uh, an ion ion interaction, so a salt formation to uh, a much larger energy. And what we found is an energy of 200 yeah, to 36, yeah? showing clearly to the, that. Um, the active is protonated and the yeah, polymer is yeah, the deprotonated. The impact on various polysoluble free bases yeah, um, is shown on this slide. And um, the, sat yeah, the saturation solubility is compared not to the solubility of the free base, but uh, to the solubility of the hydrochloride here. Because uh, yeah, for yeah, comparison reasons, that, uh, um, we determine the solubility of the free base in hydrochloric acid, yeah, where, where the hydrochloride is formed. Yeah. Behavior of the actives um, yeah, is, of course, very much different. Yeah. There are actives um, uh, leading to um, a very high enhancement, yeah, and there are other actives that are. Uh, um, yeah, which which um, yeah do not show such a high increase in solubility. Coming back to the manufacturing methods, yeah, because this is a, a very important uh, yeah the factor to consider, and uh, I remember the questions that are right yeah right from the beginning that. Uh, um, I do not have a particular machinery for making solid dispersions. Yeah? Um, one, one approach to the, from my perspective, which hasn't been yeah, pursued so much, yeah, is fluid bed granulation or fluid bed drying. Everybody, everybody has a fluid bed. You have to run it with organic solvents, of course. Yeah, but the same what you can do in spray drying yeah, can also be done in a fluid bed. And you end up with particles that, uh, which are larger. Yeah, you can do like pellet layering. Yeah, pellet, pellet layering or drug, drug layering is uh, yeah, to nothing, it's nothing else. Yeah, it's the same. Yeah, so I'm really a little bit astonished that uh, yeah, well, this approach that, uh, is not used um, yeah, to a larger extent. And everybody relies on, on, yeah, on, on hot metal extrusion and spray drying. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, the same uh, yeah, technologies 
um, as for solid dispersions, can also be used uh, via here. Um, just to uh, yeah, to finish to, uh, this part, uh, I'm going to show to, uh, some dissolution curves and also yeah, some biodata. Um, yeah, dissolution out of a polymeric salt is quick. Here we made a polymeric salt to, uh, with uh, haloperidol. Uh, yeah, yeah, and you see yeah, within 10 minutes, uh, yeah, the whole yeah, the drug salt is dissolved. Uh. Um, the same happens that uh, here we use the tyrosine kinase inhibitor. Yeah, the same happened uh, yeah, in this case, but uh, you probably know tyrosine kinase inhibitors um, show a very much pH dependent solubility. Yeah, when they enter the intestine, where the pH yeah, gets higher, yeah, they tend to crystallize quickly. Yeah, and this also happens here. It shows yeah, this new material is not a crystallization inhibitor. Yeah? It is a material that uh, increasing the solubility of a drug in water yeah? or even in hydrochloric acid. Yeah? However, it does not prevent um, crystallization later on. How yes, yeah, so we were a little bit disappointed yeah, when we saw this curve yeah, because yeah, we said, oh, Shall we go to the docs and, 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 and check whether there is an increase? Uh, um, yeah, we did it. And uh, yeah, fortunately, yeah, we did it yeah, because this is the outcome. It's really surprising yeah, because the dissolution curves look, I would say, pretty, pretty much the same. And this is a, yeah, the commercial drug formulation, yeah? um, what you see here. Yeah. The same amount of drug as the base, yeah? the same amount of drug in both formulations, yeah? and we got the fourfold bioavailability. So something must happen. Yeah? Yeah, something must happen which is not reflected there by the simple yeah, the dissolution study, yeah, but this is not, uh, I would say, not a very rare case that, uh, that the dissolution curves uh, yeah, do not fit. Um, yeah, what we see later on um, yeah, in dogs. Okay, what are, as a summary, did, uh, what are the benefits did, uh, of, the, of the polymeric salt approach? Yeah, we have an amorphous state, yeah, which should not uh, be able to crystallize anymore, even in a dry state. Yeah. Um, we have a higher solubility of the active yeah, in, in almost all cases. Yeah. We have a high dissolution speed yeah, due to the small molecular weight of the polymer. Yeah, yeah, this is also very, I would say, very crucial. Yeah? The larger the molecular weight of a polymer, the higher the viscosity gets. Yeah? And you uh, yeah, to come to kind of a gelling effect when the solid or oral dosage form dissolves. And this prevents dissolution. Yeah? So it's a low molecular weight. And uh, it's a new compound. Yeah. yeah, that's also a good question. It can be considered as a new drug, as a new active, or it can be considered as a new formulation. It's how you want to play it, yeah? To use it yeah, for, patent, yeah, for patent purposes, yeah? Uh, yeah, either to apply for a patent or to circumvent a patent or, or whatever, yeah? Um, so I think extended patent protection can be achieved, yeah, which is a very interesting point here. Yeah. Yeah, simple manufacturing, I already mentioned it. And it's not only suitable for, uh, yeah, for solid oral dosage forms, it's also suitable for liquids yeah, because it's absolutely stable. Yeah, there is no group contained in the polymer which can hydrolyze. Acrylic acid or the carboxylic acid has, has nothing to hydrolyze to that. And vinyl prolidone is also stable to hydrolysis. Yeah? So nothing uh, yeah, should happen in this regard. Yeah? So we have developed this polymer. Yeah? It's not finished yet. Yeah? What uh, we are looking for is um, yeah, we want to uh, partner yeah, with, a f with a pharma company here. Um, or with a consortium or whatever, in order to finish yeah, this development. 
So this is an opportunity you might um, yeah, to think about yeah, whether this is um, yeah, the worthwhile yeah, for you too. Okay, um, last slide from my side here. Um, I already mentioned a lot of um, yeah, new approaches, also challenges yeah, which uh, um, haven't been solved so far. Uh, what we definitely need is a uh, highly effective, um, yet toxicologically safe solubilizer for parenterals. Yeah, that this is a strong need. And yet there are only limited a limited number of excipients yeah, which can be used, um, and this is definitely not sufficient. We also need uh, yeah, the better aggregation inhibitors for biologics. I think the polysorbates that uh, will decrease. Yes, yeah, to some others that uh, have to come and take uh, yeah, to their position. Yeah. We need solutions for BCS class three um, and and four actives. Yeah. Uh, we definitely need better crystallization inhibitors for oral applications. This is also an approach to uh, where there is a lot of potential to uh, And Ferdinand to uh, will I think tomorrow. We had to talk about uh, yeah, this, uh, we had a very interesting topic. Um, and we need also excipients that are, which target uh, actives to a certain part of the body or to a certain tissue. Yeah. So, and we have to continue in the development of new excipients. Yeah? And what I would like to see if, as a supplier and as an innovator to the in excipients, I would like to see we yeah, also yeah, more, more support from your side regarding excipients. You are all risk averse, I know. I have been working in pharma, it's very risk averse. To, uh, but at least as a, as a second option, yeah, you should, yeah, you should uh, yeah, to work with uh, new chemical entities because only when doing this to, uh, we can continue our way and I think only when developing new excipients that uh, we will have the opportunity to come to break through um, new drug, uh, yeah, the drug delivery systems. BASF, we create chemistry.